here, Jen Cotton, to introduce Dave. Thank you, Dan. I am so excited to have Dave joining us today for World Ocean Day. He is one of the leaders in the world of ocean exploration and one of my favorite scientists to follow. So I'm very excited to have him join us. He's an oceanographer and explorer and for nearly 30 years was the director of special projects at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Um, he is also the Senior Advisor for Strategic Initiatives at RMS Titanic Incorporated. Today, he is independent and remains at the forefront of ocean exploration, participating in, being witness to, and communicating develop of new technology and scientific discoveries that help shape the view of planet Earth. If you have not seen his TED Talks, I highly recommend viewing those as well. Um, absolutely amazing. The kids, I showed it to my students every single year to kick off our ocean unit and they're just amazing so with that we're gonna go ahead and bring in dave hey jen hey dan and hello everybody Hi, dave. Dave. thank you for joining us today thank you for mentioning my ted talks you know oh, for yeah. a long time many many years it was number three and i said ah that doesn't matter and then i went to number six and i said ah it doesn't matter and then i went to number eight and now it's number 28 so what? Back up. Well, hopefully, yeah, back up. Uh, I need, we'll you up to number number one. So <laughs> I, need, I need five million views. So quick, give me five. Uh, so Dave, you've had a long journey in the world of studying the ocean, and I'm not going to mention geology. <laughs> had a long running career studying the ocean, um, many of which, you know, I I grew up kind of learning about. Um, in schools and connect. Once I connected it to you, I was like, oh my gosh, this is the same person doing all this cool stuff. Um, so can you just go ahead and start by telling the kids watching, how did you get to this point? You know, making your way to, to studying Titanic and hydrothermal vents and all that amazing stuff. I, you're seeing a lovely picture of planet earth taken from space. And uh, it's something we've all become uh, familiar with. And what we forget is how much effort went into making that picture possible because we had to actually get off the planet, go out into space and turn around and look at Earth from space. And uh, it was an immense achievement. And like I said, yet today we just look at it like, oh yeah, we take it for granted. That's a problem because uh, it's a planet that we need to understand. And when you see something like this, because you can see it, you think you understand it, but we don't. And that's a snapshot of the planet Earth. And there's 7 billion of us living there. And everything's changing always. Your life is always changing. Uh, the, the, uh, if this was a video and we sped it up, you'd see the clouds changing. Storms would come and go. The ocean's changing. Tides are rising and falling. Uh, all that stuff. So really a snapshot, as beautiful as it is, doesn't really give us a great idea of what's in the planet. And uh, that's just going to be most of what I'm talking about is our, our relationship with Earth. You know, a lot of what I do and the people I've worked with over the past 10, 20, 30 years, uh, it always begins with a dream. And usually it's a dream of exploration. We want to know what's out there. A lot of people look up at the skies. I do too sometimes. Heavens are beautiful, stars and the like. But it's not just about that. It's about this planet and thinking about what goes on at the bottom of the sea, what goes on on our, on our planet. And it's a fascinating world. And, uh, you know, you should never make the mistake of thinking that everything's been done already. It hasn't been done. And because we have to be better citizens of Earth today because of things like pollution and climate change or not, we have to take action. And to take action that's real effective action you need to understand what you're talking about. Before you can understand it, you've got to explore it. So dreams are powerful, and also they're extremely important to keep in mind that you should dream. I want to show you something that I, I'm going to put it ahead in the presentation because I took this uh, screen grab just uh, a little while ago. And what you're seeing there is pretty interesting. You know, we're going to talk about the oceans. And all those specks you see on the screen there are, are boats. And they're big boats. They're their ships. They're carrying ore, coal, and things like that, iron ore and the like. They're carrying uh, uh, oil. The red ones that you see on there are carrying oil. The green ones are carrying cargo. 
you know, on, on Earth, uh, on, especially in the States, about 90 something percent of everything we uh, we use comes by ocean from other places. Most of what we import comes by ocean. And those are the green boats. The brown ones are fishing boats. But look at how many boats are out there in the ocean at any given time. Again, it's a snapshot. All those boats are moving. And you can kind of see where there's traffic, straight lines of boats going from one place to the other place, which is really kind of cool. So there's hundreds of thousands of boats out there at any time. And many, 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 most are, are pretty big boats. At the same time, think about this. These are planes. And what you're seeing there are flights. Uh, some are blue, some orange. They're coming from uh, Europe on the right side of your screen to the States on the left side. Uh, this is afternoon. And so during the afternoon, late morning, afternoon, uh, the planes are going pretty much from Europe to North America, from right to left. And you can see that, again, just like the boats, they follow it almost in a line. So it's like a, a highway in the sky. Uh, but pretty soon, like right about now, the, the direction changes. And planes start going from, uh, from uh, North America back over to Europe along the same lines. And... Uh, uh, that's pretty cool. I live on Cape Cod, which sticks out into the oceans. And one of the neat things is right around this time of day and until nighttime, uh, I can walk outside, look up at the sky and see these planes uh, heading from here to Europe. And I love that because with this kind of a program, this is called Flight Radar, a uh, Flight Radar 24, I can actually uh, see the different planes and, and know where what they are, where they came from, where they're going. Uh, the important point of these last two slides that I showed you is that there's an awful lot going on in terms of humanity on the oceans. Goods coming back and forth in boats going back and forth and planes going back and forth. And again, tens of thousands of flights every single day going across the ocean. And uh, that's important. So it's not just this big, big empty space out there that no one cares about. Uh, when you dream, a lot of people dream about the ocean like this. They dream about the beach. I dream about the beach. It's a wonderful place. You know, just about a mile from where I'm sitting, we have a gorgeous beach. And, uh, and that's a great thing to think about the sand and the ocean and the warmth of the sand. But, you know, that's a very tiny bit about the ocean. It's a great place. It's where humanity and the oceans come together. But uh, there's a lot more to oceans. And just because it's shallow water, relatively shallow water, doesn't mean we understand that either. You know, it's it's pretty much once you get below the air on the, on the image like this, you start to enter a totally different world. Um, you know, a lot of times when we don't know what's out there, we start thinking about making, we make monsters of the, of the deep. Sharks are one thing, just because they've got this great big toothy grin. And, and they're pretty good at what they do with the other predators is that we want to make monsters of animals like this. And certainly sea monsters, books are full of sea monsters in the old map because we don't know what's out there. So we made up all of these, uh, a lot of these things. And so, you know, a lot of, of what we do in my field is we try to understand animals. First of all, what's out there? And second of all, we try to understand the landscape. You know, it's just flat, mud covered. What's, what's up at the bottom of the ocean? Because we know it's pretty, pretty deep. So again, it's the process of exploring. And guess what? When you think about the ocean, we've only explored about 10% at most. It's more like eight or seven or eight percent. We've explored better, very, very little about the world's ocean. This is what got me uh, when in terms of dreaming. Uh, one day I opened up, I looked at this magazine, National Geographic, and I was pretty old then. I was in my 20s, so pretty old. And uh, you know, I grew up in the Finger Lakes of central New York, beautiful lakes. And I thought the oceans were you know, a few hundred feet deep, covered with mud at the bottom. I knew there were sharks out there. I knew people scuba dived. But this article that you see on the right, especially that picture, uh, stopped me in my tracks because that's an underwater mountain. And in some places, it, later on in the article, it says that mountain that you see going from the top left to the lower right is as high as Mount Everest is deep. And see that little tiny speck where it says layer four, there's a little speck there inside that yellow circle. And then it blows up that speck and there's a tiny little submarine. Well, it's not that tiny. <laughs> On the picture, it's tiny. There's a submarine with three people inside it called Elvin. 
and exploring that underwater world. And it says there's volcanoes. You can see in the lower right some lower some lava coming out of the seafloor, the strange animals, and who knew? And there was something about that picture that made flipped a switch in me, and I said, "That's what I want to do," because that is really cool. You know, finding stuff at the bottom of the sea in the dark, turning on a light, you don't know what you're going to find. That really captivated me. Um, so back to this again. You know, I mentioned before that nine uh, nine billion of us live, uh, seven to nine billion somewhere, we'll say eight, uh, live on the planet. You can't see us from here because we're like uh, microbes on, on the planet, uh, like bacteria. And just like bacteria, you know, if we don't do things right, we make the planet sick. And we have, even though you can't see us, we've managed to change the chemistry of the seawater and the temperature of the seawater and the chemistry and temperature of the uh, air above us. That's a bad thing. So why is it a bad thing? Because that means the earth has to change. And when the earth changes to respond to what we did, everything has to put up with it. You either adapt or you suffer. Some places uh, thrive in that, but most uh, animals and Creatures like us can't adapt fast enough. So we need to, what do we need to know? We need to know what our impact is. What do we need to do to treat the oceans with the respect they deserve? Why do they deserve respect? Well, let me tell you this, that every other breath of fresh air you take, you can thank the ocean for the oxygen that comes out of the sea. 90 something percent of the water you drink comes out of the oceans. So the air we breathe, the water we drink, and food, fish, fish, for, for instance, uh, there are about several billion people on the planet that depend upon the ocean for protein. And I know we enjoy fish now and then too. So the food we eat, the air we breathe, the water we drink, um, all comes out of the sea. It comes out of this thing that's changing because we're changing it. And yet we don't know enough about it. relationship with this thing trying to keep us alive. And we need to know how that is and how do we keep the oceans healthy. We make the ocean sick, we get sick, we kill the oceans, we'll kill ourselves. Okay, um, from an oceanographer point of view, if we get rid of the clouds, get rid of the atmosphere, um, get rid of the water, uh, that's what the earth looks like. I mean, leave the water there for the time being, but that's the earth. And all we've done here is spun the earth around and we're looking at the Pacific Ocean, amazing. You know what? The earth is covered with water, 70% covered with water. And in your mind, well, I think I know what that means. Well, that's what it means. Wait, right here, what you're looking at is if you look at the Pacific Ocean, there's almost no land there. You can't see in the upper right, there's some a little bits of North America. In the lower left, there's New Zealand and Australia. But the rest of it, it's, there's some islands in there. It's nothing but blue. So that's an awful lot of water. Average depth of the oceans is about two and a half miles, which is deep, way deeper than snorkeling can get you, way deeper than scuba, scuba can get you. Two and a half mi miles is an awful lot of water. Um, now, take that water away, and I want you to look at the bottom of the ocean. You see the continents there in tan, but in the middle of the ocean, which are blue here, you see there's a mountain range. It goes right down through the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It goes up south of Africa into the Indian Ocean where it splits in two, then it heads over into the Pacific Ocean. It's part of this thing called the Ring of Fire. It's all volcanic, full of earthquakes, but it's the greatest mountain range by far, the greatest mountain range on planet Earth. It's incredible. There's thousands of peaks as high as the Alps. There's thousands of valleys many times wider and deeper than the Grand Canyon. And again, we've only explored a few percent of that, but when we do, we're absolutely amazed at what we see. Now, just like the planet, the, the, uh, these ridges that you see, this mountain range is, and the ring of fire is part of the thing called plate tectonics. Important, plate tectonic is something that describes the surface of the earth and how it behaves. Basically, the surface of the earth is constantly changing, change, change, change. It's a planet that's very dynamic and changing. And if you look at North America, you can see in the ridge down the middle, you'll see that it kind of fits into Africa. Look at South America, it kind of fits into Africa. And so if you, you, you can push those back together again. And what we found out is that for about the past 180 million years, they've been moving apart from one another. They still are. And when, so the continents are moving around 
on the surface of the Earth. And I think I've got an animation to show that. Here's first of all, here's a close-up of the uh, Mid Ocean Ridge called the Mid Ocean Ridge, and you can see Africa how well it fits into that ridge, and the ridge how well it fits into North America. Same thing with South America and Africa. So they used to be together. It's the coolest thing because you can go to South America and find rocks and fossils that match the rocks and fossils all the way across the ocean in, in Africa. Here's the animation. And you can see on the lower left, those are millions of years going by. So it's really sped up. But you'll see here that right around there, the ocean starts to open up. So North America is pulling away from Africa and the Atlantic Ocean is being born. And right about now, it starts 120 million years, the South, South Atlantic is being born as well. And there's India in the right crashing into Asia, making the Himalayas. So the planet has been changing for billions and billions of years, and it hasn't stopped, still changing today, plate tectonics. Back to the ocean again. So how do we begin to explore the ocean? I said it was too deep to snorkel, too deep to scuba dive. So we have to use um, uh, technology. And in this case, you'll see there in the background, a ship, a big one uh, called Atlantis, and then a submarine in the front called Alvin, which both of those used to belong to the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And uh, what's amazing about this is on that ship, back there, there's about 50 people all working very hard to make sure that the people inside the submarine are, are, are protected, stay alive. The submarine in the front, that's the same submarine you saw on that can-drawn cartoon, Elvin. The two people you see there on the front, they're divers, we call them divers. And they're really there to make sure that all the scientific gear, the lights, the care, everything outside the sub is in the right place. Right beneath them, there's a sphere. And it's a very thick titanium sphere, very strong, with some portholes in it. And it's strong enough to hold back the pressure of the ocean, which is pretty amazing. So right now, three people inside there and 50 people on the ship all working together. It's not just those three people uh, to do an expedition to the bottom of the sea. There's a look inside the Elvin on the right, the submarine. On the left is the Apollo and a, a space capsule. And you can see they're very, very similar. The capsule on the left is designed to hold three people. And on the right, same thing. You see there on the right, there's a, a pilot and he's looking out the front porthole. And then on either side of him would be a scientist that would look out to either side of the submarine. And the rest is all electronics. There's recorders and sonars and all sorts of other stuff because they're going to the deep. But you're in a capsule, just like space. You're protected from that outside world. And uh, you know, take a look at what that's like to dive on the submarine. And here's a typical Elven launch. It's not as exciting as the space shuttle, but it, it is as, uh, as uh, I'm, sure, I'm sorry, it doesn't have the same rockets and stuff like a space shuttle, but to us, it's very exciting. So there's three people inside there, as I said before, and uh, you get in on board the ship and then they lift you up on this crane called an A-frame. And it takes a while to get up off the deck. You get very excited by being inside there because you know they're just moments away from being put into the ocean right now, splash. And you get that lovely color blue when the sub is rocking gently, hopefully if the weather's good. And so now there you are on the surface and it's time for the divers, those guys to check out the all the gear. And once they say you're okay to go, you fill a little bit of water into the sub and down you go. It takes two and a half hours to go from here to the bottom. And uh, on the way down, the light goes from bright blue to light blue to blue, deep blue, dark blue, pitch black. And so most of that time, about two and a half hours to get to the bottom, about two of it, the ocean's perfectly pitch black. And because the sun has never been there, uh, so it's freezing cold too. So it's an incredible journey from the world of light and warm up here to the world of dark down below. Uh, we didn't think there'd be much life on the way down because there's no light and no light, no plants, no plants, no animals. Yet, when we stop and look, we find all sorts of bizarre animals live inside that world. From the surface all the way down to the very bottom, we're finding different kinds of life. And that's amazing. This is a neat thing. It's a, I call it a jellyfish because I'm a geologist, but it's called a siphonophore. Uh, they get to be very long. This one looks like a spaceship of some sort. 
And you know, every, almost every dive, every dive, we're finding new species of life. Sometimes little tiny things, sometimes bigger things, uh, but all sorts of animals we never thought could or would exist. A lot of them have their own lights. This is refraction from our, our lights of the sub, but a lot of them have lights like, almost most of them have lights just like fireflies that you might see in your backyard because they try to communicate with one, one another inside the dark. They want to attract prey and they want to avoid being eaten. So they've learned how to work in that world of, of uh, darkness. When you get to the top of that mountain range at the bottom, it's amazing too, because there we're finding incredibly hot water coming out of the seafloor. Remember I said there was lava but, uh, in the rocks down there, uh, deep inside the rocks. Well, that heats up seawater and comes out like this. That's incredibly hot water. It's like 700 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, it's come, It's dark because it's very toxic, full of things that would kill us in a heartbeat. And so uh, it's full of hydrogen sulfide and things like that. It comes from the inside of the earth. It's got that rotten, eggy smell if you've ever been around a hot spring. And so we were sure. So we're so deep, two and a half miles, pressure's intense, toxic chemicals coming out of the seafloor, incredibly hot. Uh, all sorts of earthquakes and volcanoes. There couldn't possibly be life here. And yet, one day, some geologists were looking at uh, picking up volcanic rocks, and they came across something like this, which is a pillar. as a volcanic pillar, and it's loaded with life. And they're not tiny animals. They're, those things you see that white tubes with red tips, we call them tube worms. They can be three feet, five feet, seven feet long. We have crabs, clams, shrimp, all sorts of animals living here. In one spot, there was 300 animals and about 200, some, some of them were never seen before. And see, there's a crab right in the middle center, you know, a little white crab. He's going to try to grab a tube worm. No, didn't quite get it that time. So uh, look at the density, how many animals there are in one spot packed together. And the diversity, like I said, hundreds of species all in one spot. And that's incredible. It's like more than the tropical rainforest. And the funny thing about these, the important thing about this is that these animals those, that's a fish, by the way. It looks like an eel, but it's a fish. Uh, the important thing about these animals is they're living off that chemical energy that said it was toxic to us. Uh, so the oceans really neat that way. It's, uh, it's not that the, the earth is polluting itself. It's a system that cycles water through it. And so for us, not so good. But these animals are thriving down there on the bottom of the ocean. And just by finding these by accident almost, remember I said there were just picking up rocks, geologists, it totally revolutionized the way we think about life on planet Earth. Because you didn't always need the sun, photosynthesis. Sometimes the energy came from inside the Earth out. And, you know, we're just beginning to understand what these uh, thermal vents mean to us. All those animals were living there because they had a source of food, like most animals do. If there's food, they'll hang around. And they're eating microbes that turn the poisonous water into sugar. So as a microbe, turns the poisonous water into sugar. So those animals live there because that's where they can get their energy. Yet sometimes in the background, there's big animals living. And this is one of them. This is an octopus that's uh, very interested in the submarine. So he's coming toward the submarine. That's his eye, flying with his ears. So he's got the great name Dumbo, the Dumbo octopus, because he looks like the elephant Dumbo flying with his ears. His arms are curled up. But again, he's coming toward the sub because he's very curious, this big giant thing with lights and propellers. And they're very intelligent, these animals are. So now that we know they're there, we, we take the time to look for them, animals like this. And a number of different species of this kind of octopus have been found. And they're big. You know, like if you stretched them out, it'd be like four feet big. And the wonderful thing I think about exploring is that you have to be able sometimes to look out the window of the submarine and describe something for the very first time any human beings ever laid eyes on it. Like Dumbo, look at that. Imagine looking out the window and seeing that thing coming at the submarine. You know, you have no idea what it was. It's never been seen before. And that's one of the great things about exploration. Here's a picture of a, like a nighttime shot of a pool of water. And uh, you see waves in it a little on the right side. It's cut, the waves have cut a notch into the rocks. Well, guess what? It's at the bottom of the ocean. So it's a pool that's full of brine. It's very heavy. The water is very salty. And so it sits beneath the ocean. 
it's like a reverse lake. So you have lakes, then you have oceans, which are saltier than lakes. Then you have this super salty water sitting on the bottom. And you can see that there's uh, waves in it. We also have underwater rivers. They're called currents at the surface, but they flow across the bottom of the ocean. And we have underwater waterfalls. So we've got the greatest topography. We've got underwater mountains, underwater valleys, underwater rivers, underwater waterfalls, underwater lakes, and very bizarre animals. And all in that world that we've hardly explore, explored at all, except for about 8 to 10%. So what's in that other 90%? You know, it just amazes me that we, did we get everything exciting? No, of course not. So the rest of the ocean's waiting to be discovered, which is pretty cool for anyone that wants to go into ocean exploration. All right, sometimes, you know, we've seen some stuff I showed you, the lake, the underwater volcanoes, and we never knew they existed, Dumbo the octopus. Sometimes things sink into the ocean, and we did know they were there. It was just a matter of finding them. And Titanic, everyone knows about Titanic. Well, there's the bow of Titanic. Big shipwreck sank in 1912. And uh, finding Titanic wasn't easy. I, I co-led the last mapping expedition and the first mapping expedition to Titanic. So there we are sitting on the bow of Titanic. In this case, it's a robot. Those are the anchor chains on either side of the bow. And uh, Titanic's very cool. Uh, as I said, most people on the planet, you say Titanic, they know what you mean. And uh, that's where the steering wheel, the ship's wheel used to be right here on Titanic. That's all that's left of the bridge. So over time, we've learned a little bit about Titanic. We're still learning a lot. And one of the things we're learning that's really important is how to work around shipwrecks. Because I showed you all those boats on the ocean. Well, every single year, about 14 big boats the size of Titanic sink to the bottom of the ocean. And they sink in storms and things like that. And usually there's 20 or 30 people on board. They're tankers and cargo ships. They're not like a luxury liner like Titanic. But they sink. And today, in the past, we would say they're gone forever. They sank into that big deep world. Uh, but and today we know that we can reach any shipwreck and people want to know what happened to the crew. Why did the ship sink? That kind of thing. So we're learning how to do that because we've been back to Titanic and back and back and back. How do you learn to explore something that uh, has all these sharp edges and cables and things like that? And thanks to Titanic, uh, we're actually learning better how to do that and what kind of equipment we need. So it's not just the ship. There's other things that we need to do as well. We, you know, we made a map, and on top is a map made with sonar uh, sound. And on the bottom is one we made of, with cameras. And, and uh, you'll see, the, so that's the bow of Titanic. You see the pointy end on the right. And you can see the anchors I pointed to, and then the different hatches and the mast and the like. But the one made with sound up on top, eh, it's not so bad. You know, you, it's not as good as the uh, cameras are, but it's pretty cool. So sonar, mapping things with sound has become very important beneath the ocean. So as I was saying, it's not just the hull, it's also the seafloor around Titanic. There's hundreds of thousands of objects and there's a piece of the ship there. Many of the objects are from the ship. Many of the objects are from the people that were on board the ship and that sank into the deep. And uh, it's important because it is a cultural site. It's an important site to understand what's there and what shape is it in. We have no idea really everything that's there. And yet we have the technology to be able to do that. So over the past few years, we've been very carefully mapping the bottom of the sea like that barrel uh, and uh, other things you see here, wires and lights and things like that. Uh, there's a great one, there's a cup sitting on the bottom of the oceans, two and a half miles deep. And it's got the logo on the front, white star lines. And so, you know, it's a pretty impressive thing to see something like that. But we're trying to find out where everything is and what shape it's in. Um, recently, this is cool. And I'm not making an, uh, an ad for Legos, but this is the Lego model of the Titanic. And it's got 900-something nine, pieces. Or is it 9,000? 9, 9,000 pieces inside it. And uh, uh, it's pretty amazing. And I've got one of those, so I've got to start putting it together. And what I like about it is that you can actually pull it apart and see uh, on the right is part of the Titanic uh, showing the engines and the ship pulls apart. So you can actually see the same engines made with Legos on the inside of the uh, of the ship. It's 900 some odd pieces, by the way. Okay. 
it's not all the deep water that I said this kind of earlier that we still need to learn a lot about the shallow water. And a lot of that's about animals. And you'll see here, we're going to creep up on this algae and watch what happens. Boom. There's an octopus sitting right there. And it's a pretty big octopus. And off he goes. This is my friend and colleague, Roger Hanlon. He's at the Marine Biological Lab. And he's the best at understanding uh, cephalopods, which includes octopuses. And they are so cool. So we're going to go backwards in time and watch this animal here on the right side. It's got smooth skin, pretty white skin, and it's going to try to make itself turn into that stuff on the left. And watch this. And this happens. This is slow motion. It happens much quicker than this and gone. How cool is that? And so sometimes, too, that uh, they can not only camouflage themselves, but they can shape shift. They can look like a coconut. They can look like a piece of coral. Uh, pretty amazing animals. Um, I want to show you this clip. It's borrowed from Nova, and I love it because it makes me laugh every time I see it. Um, there's an octopus. It's a tiny one. I have to set my timer here, sorry. Uh, it's a tiny little octopus, and uh, it's looking. this is a bad place for an octopus to be because other predators, they're pretty yummy, can get it. And one thing, when they walk, they, they try to walk like a, he's trying to look like a coconut rolling across the bottom. Notice he walks on two legs bundled up, and off he goes. And he finds a shell. That's pretty good to hide in. So he takes that shell and says, well, you know, it's not bad to hide in, but it's not great because I've only got half a shell. So he picks it up, off he goes. And it's not easy to carry a shell if you're an octopus, especially a big shell like that. But he's, look what he sees. Aha, another shell hops in between both and makes his own little fort. There he goes, pulls the sides together. How perfect is that? And then he can peek over the top. There, here's his eyes. I love this. And he's looking for prey. He's always also keeping his eye out for predators. Well, nope, nothing to eat around there. You can see that there's not much going on. So he picks up both. Now he's got both sides of the shell. There's a flatfish right there, and he's not interested in that. But he sees a crab. And guess what? Zap. And then he brings it back to his little fork for some crab munchies. And, you know, so that was not easy to do, though. And sometimes it wants to move quicker than dragging these shells all around. And when it wants to do that, the best thing to do is to pull both edges together and roll. And look at that. So he's rolling across the bottom. Cool. I mean, and this is shallow water stuff. It's not the bottom of the ocean. So everywhere from the beach on down, we're learning something pretty cool about the world around us. All right. That's the earth again. This time I'm showing you the land mostly. And you see the green where things are growing and the deserts are tan and brown. And the important thing about this, as I said, is that 7 billion people live on this planet and we're dependent on the ocean. Um, you don't see us there, but at nighttime, the planet lights up, the lights of humanity. And this is done by, you'll never see the earth all dark or all light, or we'd be in big trouble. So this is putting uh, day and night together. And you'll see that uh, the earth there, but we'll zoom in, that's that's the United States. And you'll see that the edges are lit up just because there's a lot, lot of life near the coast. But those are electric lights mostly. You can see where the different cities are. You can see where big roadways are. And like I said, you see where the coastline is. Uh, Europe, same thing. If you look at the lower, lower left, that's Spain for sure. And way above Spain, there's England and uh, Norway and Finland, Sweden. Now, there's some new kinds of lights there, the red dots. Those dots, those are from gas flares, from exploring for oil. And you'll see them there. That's Siberia on the right. This is the North Sea, little speckles on the left. Uh, down in Africa, North Africa, Tunisia, and over on the right, the Persian Gulf. So you're starting to see something new on the planet. And the brightest things from space, gas flares. That on the right, the white lines there, the white, those are the islands of Japan. And on the left, you see China and Korea sitting there. But the blue, all those blue dots, those are fishing fleets. And so look at that. They're like clouds. There's so many boats out there fishing. And we need to understand what we're doing to the oceans by fishing the way we do. Uh, we haven't been very good at it in the past. We're killing all the large fish. And to, to keep the companies going, they're catching smaller and smaller fish. And so we've done a really good job 
and killing a lot of fish on the planet, not a good way to live. As I said before, several billion people depend on protein from the ocean. This is the image that really gets me. That's Africa. And you see on top, northern Africa, there's some red lights for gas explore, oil exploration. There's a little line on the right side, and that's the uh, Nile River. It's like a white line. And then all those gold dots down south of uh, you know Sahara Desert, not much there, but all those gold dots, those are villages for burning solid fuel for heat, for light, for cooking. And in that area, all the way up through the Middle East and into China, there's a billion plus people, two billion that are clinging to life because they don't have one thing that's so important, this stuff, fresh water. Most of the earth is salt water, but it's an ocean planet and there's fresh water. And I said, most of the fresh water comes out of the ocean. So how can this be that we live on this planet of water and have billions of people without water? Uh, especially when we know that the oceans are like, the earth is like this. That's the uh, clouds. And actually it's more than clouds, it's water vapor. So even when you don't see clouds in the sky, there's still water vapor and it's really swirly and days are going by really quickly. But look at that. And now you understand why it's tough to predict weather because it's very complicated. But every time you see bright puffs of things, those are clouds popping up. And so the oceans are beneath this driving that. And so that's how the oceans are involved. The earth is all together. And the oceans, the temperature of the ocean changes. If you go from the, Atlantic, the equator, it's very hot and warm, and you go north to the Arctic, it's very cold. All right, so one day we decided, well, let's take all the water off the Earth so we understand this better. And that's the Earth, the brown is all the water is off the planet, and all the water fits into that ball on the left, the blue ball, all the water. And you say, well, how can that be, Dave? You said that the oceans cover 70%, and they're two miles and a half miles deep. Yeah, that's right. And, and but... Uh, the average depth is two and a half miles, but the ocean's thousands of miles across. So think of the layer of water. So we're thousands of miles that way, but only two miles deep. So it's like the frost on a glass. There's not much water on Earth at all. All the fresh water we have to drink is that little tiny speck on the ocean just north of Florida. Not the middle size ball, but the little ball just north of Florida. That's all the fresh water we have. For us to live the way we do, that's got to go in just the right spots, just the right amounts, at just the right time of year. Or civilization begins to get a little bit unstable, and it affects all the life on, on Earth. So again, so important that we understand the ocean, so important that we don't take it for granted. Uh, because we, the oceans are the lifeblood of, of this particular planet. And the exciting thing is that in the past, we didn't know. We made a lot of mistakes. You know, things we put on our ground, nutrients and fertilizers, pesticides, stuff like that eventually gets to the ocean, kills a lot of animals. Plastic, you go to the middle of the ocean, you'll find little bits of plastic in the stomachs of fish. If you look at the flesh of the fish, you'll find uh, herbicides and pesticides and uh, flame retardants and things like that. That's on us. That's not a natural anything. That's because we didn't know. Now we know. So now we've got to make a course correction and figure out what we can do to help the oceans heal. And as I said, as, as you can get very pessimistic about it and say, oh, no, we killed the ocean. No, no, because now we know. And it's all these baby steps that got us here. And it's baby steps that will get us out of it. But it's up to you, the audience, that you're listening uh, to take the leadership role in learning about the ocean and exploring it and being able to do something, help people do something about it. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I'm glad you mentioned some of the challenges that you face getting into your career. And, you know, you know, not everybody gets straight A's in school and, but there's still a pathway path forward. What, I mean, what would you tell students who are, are, seeing the same kind of pushback from saying, well, your grades aren't that good or, you know, studying the, studying the floor of the ocean is just too unrealistic, you know, just get a real job. Um, yeah. what, would you what would you tell them? And how would you, what was a, a piece of yeah. advice that you would give them? Yeah. I hear a couple of things. One, I work with a team of people that uh, 
um, almost every expedition. Well, first of all, when you see someone in front of the microphone or a TV camera after an expedition, that's usually not the star of the show. You know, it's, I've been had that privilege many times to represent people, but it's usually people that you never hear their name that's really the star behind the scenes. And they're everything from carpenters and electricians and technicians to scientists. Um, you know, I could say the old thing, never let anyone take your dreams away. Always keep your dreams and stuff. That's true. I mean, everyone I work with has had a really tough time in school. Uh, same kind of thing. Couldn't read, couldn't take notes, uh, disturbed others, uh, ADD-ish and more. Uh, and yet, so what we learn to do is to cope with it, find coping mechanisms. You have more help today. Ah, don't be afraid to ask for help. That's one of the important things. Uh, as weird and uncomfortable as it may be, I think you'll find that people will respond to you and things you worry every day about, every day about that make you crazy, give you anxiety, can go away like that because you know you've got other people on your side. So that's one thing I learned. Uh, second thing is, and you find it hard to believe it coming from me here, Blavin, learn to listen. You know, as your mouth is moving and stuff's coming out, stuff can't get in. So learn to listen what people say, uh, respect other views, because, you know, I've been wrong, I think, more than I've been right. Not that I go run around saying, yeah, you're wrong, but things that I thought, I go, hmm, I was wrong about that. And uh, so all these things, you shouldn't be afraid, like sports, think of it like sports, right? Um, it's not easy, because to get on the playground or on the big field, You've got to do all the things, the push-ups, the sit-ups, the stuff that I don't want to do that stuff. I just want to go here and be, well, you know, you've got to have the talent. You've got to have the passion, but you also have to have the uh, foundation. And uh, I'm not saying you've got to be a straight student at all. In fact, I don't know any straight-A students uh, uh, in, in the people I work with. There are a bunch. I just had in my group. I don't see them. Uh but, you know, I, I used to play tennis a lot and people and did pretty well. And people would say, wow, you're really passionate about that and uh, you're really good. But I would only get so far in every tournament. And then someone with training uh, would just take me to pieces because they had that foundation. So I learned, you know, passion's great. It'll get you so far. But at some point, you've got to have be able to fall back on a, on a real important background. But. You know, be if you play video games, and I'm sure some of you do, um, you know what it's like to level up, and the, you know the excitement that you get from uh, sticking. You know, it's you know, seeing it through and playing and playing and make mistakes, and you try. You talk to your friends, you read, and and eventually you level up and up and up and up. I'm not saying just play video games, but it's that same kind of passion that you want to know more and learn more and do more and et cetera, et cetera. And just keep on, think of it as like that, a challenge. It's a challenge. Think of it like uh, you're doing something, you're dreaming things that have never been dreamt before. You're asking questions that have never been asked before. And you'll be seeing things that you're probably the only person to ever see it and probably maybe the last person to ever see it on the planet. So it's a world of excitement. It's tough. It should be tough. Um, but it's pretty cool, you know. I just, just don't turn off that passion because you find it, you know, don't be a wimp, you know, just because someone roughed you up a little bit. Uh, and that's a great filter, you know. It's a great filter. If I can say, oh, you're terrible and your work is terrible and that's horrible and you go away, you know, what kind of pr – no, don't do that. You know, be have some pride, have some integrity, always learn to respect and always learn to be – I said once to a person – we have to be more tolerant. And she said to me, it was Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright of the United States. And I said, you know, we need to be more tolerant. She said, no, you need to be more accepting. And I said, all right, I get it. So you have to learn to be that too. So sorry, that's a whole bunch of, that's classic ADD. Blab, a tsunami of words <laughs> came out. But uh, get excited, you know, I mean, it's great, great. And start now. Don't say, oh, next week I'll get excited. Start now, just and be the best, you know, just keep your sights on why not be the best at what you do. And even if it's not the tallest mountain, find your own little peak and be the best of that little peak. And I always tell people that, too. You, you get a If you're the best at this tiny little thing that you do, you'll get a seat at the same table as these people up here. You really will. So. That's great advice and, um, you know, something we could all probably 
learn from, you know, even if we're not going into oceanography. Um, sp speaking specifically of oceanography, you know, what somebody's say there's a student who is, you know, in school, that's their path, that's their passion, they're, they're going to be studying it. What are, what are some best ways to translate, you know, studying, studying it and translate that into a career and where, and what, and what pathways are there, are, you know, are there a lot of careers in this, in this path um, for, for students to get into? Sure. Yeah. Uh, one thing I can tell you is that I think the field is really getting more and more important because, and I wouldn't have said that 20 years ago or 30 years ago, I, you know, I made it more important for myself, but uh, it was tough to find funding and the like, but I mean, the planet's in pretty serious shape. You know, it's uh, and it's not a matter of it's beyond the point of no return. It's beyond a matter of what kind of a future do we want. And we don't want to have unintended consequences and we want to do the right thing. So to do that, you need to know like a doctor or a dentist, you need to know what you're talking about. You know, it's not just like uh, have the surgery or uh, fill a, have a root canal. You know, you really need to know what you're talking about. And so the people, we need a lot more people. Every city, most cities in the world are built along the coast. Every one of them is a municipality in a way that's going to need a lot of people to understand the impact of humans on the water and the impact of water on the humans. Um, exploration right now is like, you know, and there's a couple of ships in the United States, three, maybe four, uh, then for the deep ocean. There's uh, as for the whole planet, there might be a half dozen ships out there doing research. Uh, that's just not enough. And now we're in the age of robots, too, where you can sit wherever you're sitting right now with a joystick, with a headset and drive around the deep ocean uh, virtually. And uh, so I think that the opportunities are getting more and more as people start to realize that they can uh, at a they're important and B, you know, there's a lot of jobs in that world uh, out there to be had by knowing, having knowledge of what to do in the uh, in the deep ocean. So. Yeah. And, you know, I, again, I, it's important. I know a lot of people, I do know students that show up with a straight A, 4.0s, very important, very great achievement. But there's a stack about that big every year of people that have got 4.0s. And it's important to bring something else to the table as well, because you're going to be part of a team. It's not just you. And so you want to be able to fit into the team and it can be passion. That's always good. You, you know, those two things are important. Uh, but to have some different angle for yourself, it could be sports, it could be music, it could just have a different, you know, don't be so one-sided that you only think about uh, the scientific things. Start to live your own life and be, you don't want everything out of a book because, you know, you've got lots of books. Uh, you would think if you walk into a, uh, you know, look at books, you think everything's been done, but mm, not even close. So you have to dream. There you go. Uh, it's like uh, learn to dream and live inside your dreams. Yeah, all that, all that good stuff. Don't get anxious. You know, just get take that energy and move forward with it. Definitely good stuff. Definitely good stuff. Um, I think Jen had um, wanted to talk about World Ocean Day with you a little bit. So sure. Yeah. So the advice you just gave the students, um, and really the teachers watching too, because I think they needed to hear some of that. Um, definitely, I know. I as an educator, I it resonated with me too. Um, but the theme this year for World Ocean Day is one ocean, one climate, one future together. And I think a lot of what you just talked about really hits on that theme. Um, so just to wrap this up, you know, the we talked about the ocean, you touched on the climate. So this one future together piece, what are things that the students watching or really just anyone watching um, can really think about moving forward from today? Yeah. I mean, if you mean one future together, the oceans and climate, they're linked like that, you know, because the oceans impact the climate, drives rain where it rains, where it doesn't rain. Climate's about two things, precipitation and temperature, those two things. And on Earth, oceans play a big role in that. Most of the heat on Earth is moved around by the ocean and given up by the ocean. And uh, where it rains and doesn't rain, where it's dry and not dry, oceans control most of that, too. It's not as simple as that, but they do. Uh, on the other side of it, one one future together, all humanity, you know, we, we are linked by the atmosphere and by the oceans. We share those two things. I'm on Cape Cod uh, here on the eastern part of the 
North America, and we can't eat fish in our ponds right outside my home here that way uh, because I'm told that it's full of mercury. Where did the mercury come from? They think Chinese coal plants way over there. And so it just goes to show you that how tightly we're linked uh, and we do have to start learning to pull together. We really do. I mean, at some point, you have to start thinking like a planet. You, you got to. I mean, because it doesn't help to have uh, what we call a developed world and a non-developed. We got to figure this out, and we can. You can do it. You know, our lives depend on it, and our future of the planet uh, depends on us being able to figure out our future together. And it goes back to what Madeline Elbright told me. It's not just about tolerate; it's about accepting. And to, to be able, you have to accept where other, you know, it does me no good to walk into a refugee camp and say, stop using plastic bottles you know, and stuff like that, because they're trying to live till tomorrow. And, you know, so we have to figure out all, it's not just about the knowledge, it's about making it useful information, if science data, useful information. About teachers, teachers to me are the portal to all this stuff. Yes, you have the power of the internet and all that. That's great. You should get on there and play and find out stuff. Uh, but teachers become that entry into that world. And, you know, one of the things there, I've always said this, still feel that way, is let the teachers teach. You know, stop giving them this cookbook and saying everything, you know, it's all right here. Let them teach. Because other than that, otherwise, you're taking away the one thing that you can infect people with, which is passion for what you do. And so uh, I got it all figured out, by the way. <laughs> no, I don't have it all figured out. Uh, again, I think the future is bright if we get our act together. And we need to understand the planet's been changing. I worry that we get, you know, I used to be an analyst for CNN. I guess I still am. And we have a tendency to want headlines. We love headlines. And the more headlining it is, the you know, this smashed that, this blew up that. And uh, um it's often not like that. And you know, I think that sometimes we have to realize that it's just the small things sometimes are the, uh, are the uh, most important things. And, uh, you know, I think that I worry about some of these gimmicky things. Like, yeah, you know, I see T-shirts that say, stop climate change. Uh, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, uh, where are we going to stop that? You know, with seasons, you want to stop seasons? You want to stop day and night? That's a climate change. Uh, I know what they mean. I got it. It's like there used to be shirts that say stop plate tectonics meaning we want the earth the continents to stop moving and earthquakes to stop and volcano uh, but but the climate's been changing for four billion years what we want to stop is human impact on climate because we can't predict what's next and it's, so far it's not been good it comes down to two things pollution polluting the air polluting the water it's still those things and right at the core of it is humanity so i worry sometimes we grab onto the buzzy things buzzwords when the important stuff is maybe not so buzzy, but it's stop polluting. And we shouldn't put any more in the atmosphere than we absolutely need to. We shouldn't put any more in the water than we absolutely need to. That's a great place to start. But. All right. Well, thank you so much for that, Dave. That was an amazing presentation and um, great advice for students and teachers alike. And um, yeah, I mean, it was just a overall um, very inspiring talk. So we really appreciate your time. And, um, you know, I, I really love what you said about setting yourself apart and, um, you know, making yourself uh, unique um, in, in a world that's very competitive uh, these days. And that's one thing that Headwater Science Institute definitely focuses on, um, helping students um, take their research and take their science education to a, a, a next level. And with that in mind, um, our research experience is, is really great for that. It's um, an immersive semester long program that pairs students up with professional scientists um, from all walks of life, um, different areas of study and all of that and um, allows students to, to get field research, hands-on experience doing real science. And um, so if you're interested in that, head over to the, the URL that's listed below and check it out and hopefully um, sign up and take your science career and science education to the next level. It's also um, really great for impressing those college recruiters. Um, so yeah, with that, um, we'll wrap up this episode of Lunch with the Scientists and say thank you to everybody who watched and uh, thanks again to Dave Gallo. Uh, we appreciate it and we'll see you all next time.